On the cloudy, hazy day of April 25th, 1977, a Japanese fishing trawler called the Zuiu Maru was casting its nets off the east coast of New Zealand. The boat was a commercial fishing vessel working for Taiyo Fishery Company Limited, and as a trawler, its method of fishing was to cast nets to the desired depth, then drag them behind the boat to scoop up unsuspecting fish. Trawling is a controversial method of fishing, and one reason for this is that there's no way to selectively choose what might be caught in that net. Anything and everything in the path of the net can be caught up in it, including things that no one is prepared for or expecting. That was the case that day in April, when the crew of the Zuiumaru began pulling up its nets from a depth of about 300 meters, or approximately 1,000 feet. The desired catch was mackerel, but along with the fish there was something else. Something large and heavy, and when it was pulled up, the initial thought of the crew was that it was the rotting body of a whale. Intending to pull the unknown creature out of the net and then deposit it back into the ocean so that the day's catch could be brought on board without being contaminated, the carcass was attached to some ropes and lifted into the air. Suddenly, what was initially believed to be a whale took on a different shape, one that the crew of the Zuiumaru found unusual. The creature was quite large, weighing about 4,000 pounds or approximately 1,800 kilograms, and measured 10 meters or approximately 33 feet long. It appeared to have a sizable body, a medium-length neck and head, four flippers, and a short tail. The creature's organs were missing, likely eaten by scavengers, and so the body cavity was empty. The flesh of the body was noted in detail, being described as red and rotting, with a white fat that fell away from the muscle. On the back of the creature were V-shaped marks that looked like vertebrae, and the ribs were quite short for the size of the body, at only about 40 centimeters or approximately 16 inches. Understandably a bit perplexed, the crew bandied about different possible identifications for the creature, and as this was going on, assistant production manager Michihiko Yano began to wonder if what they'd found could be identified as a known animal at all. Deciding to document the find as well as he could, Yano borrowed a camera from a crewmate and took the photographs that would become the subject of debate for not just the next few years, but the next half a century. However, despite the belief shared amongst the crew that this could be a potentially significant find, they couldn't risk keeping the body. It was dangerous to keep something that was rotting on a ship alongside fish that were meant to be eaten by people, and so the captain and crew agreed to put the body back in the water just as they'd originally intended. Except, suddenly, the rope slipped. The creature crashed onto the deck of the ship, having slid out of the ropes holding it above it, and thoroughly contaminating the deck. This was no doubt frustrating to the crew, who would now have to disinfect the entire area once they finally did manage to get the body dumped overboard, but it was also an opportunity. Yano began to take measurements of the creature, marking down proportions and other details that would be important for identification, and also had the presence of mind to do the one thing that is lacking from so many other cryptid investigations, take physical evidence. Yano took several tissue samples from one of the back fins, treating them with bleach to disinfect them before storing them for later analysis. These samples would later go on to play a vital role in attempts to identify the creature. But now, with measurements, photographs, and samples taken, it was time to remove the unknown body from the Zuiumaru and return it to the sea. That done, the ship was disinfected, their catch of fish brought on board, and life and work went on. It was about a month and a half later, on June 10th, that Yano finally returned home to Japan. The creature was still on his mind, and he had the photographs he'd taken developed and when he showed them to co-workers and management, they were fascinated. That intrigue only grew when the photos were shown to scientists, but none of them could positively identify what they were looking at. Over the next week or so, speculation began to spread rapidly, and July 20th, 1977 marked the beginning of an absolute frenzy of attention centered around one main question. Could the mysterious creature have been a plesiosaur? Plesiosaur may or may not be a familiar word, depending on whether you had a dinosaur phase and what kind of movies you might have watched, but the appearance of these creatures is strongly ingrained in the public consciousness. Plesiosaurs were prehistoric reptiles that lived in the oceans of the late Triassic period to the end of the Cretaceous period, when they suffered the same fate as many other species during the extinction event now believed to have been caused by a massive meteor impact. This means that the Plesiosaurus order thrived for about 137 million years. Plesiosaurs are typically divided into two categories, long-necked and short-necked, but both categories were similar except for, perhaps unsurprisingly, the length of the neck and the size of the head. Both types had moderately sized bodies with four flippers, as well as short tails. The fins were bony, with finger-like structures much like modern-day dolphins, and both long-necked and short-necked plesiosaurs had mouths full of sharp teeth. Plesiosaurs varied in size by species, and the upper end of the range is subject to a little debate, 
but the generally accepted size range is from 1.5 meters or approximately 5 feet to 15 meters or approximately 49 feet. Like dinosaurs, plesiosaurs were reptiles, although it is still debated whether or not they were cold or warm-blooded, and they breathed air rather than through gills. Plesiosaurs are, generally, a very popular explanation for many marine cryptids. The most famous, of course, is the Loch Ness Monster, and the plesiosaur theory has been a very long-standing one. The idea of a prehistoric creature having survived extinction and somehow avoided human detection for thousands of years is not just a romantic idea, it's one that has at least one famous example, the coelacanth, a large fish believed to have gone extinct during the KT extinction event 65 million years ago, until it was discovered alive and well off the coast of South Africa in 1938. The general idea is that if it happened once, then it can happen again, especially since the coelacanth had been discovered in a trawl net, just like the unknown creature pulled up by this Wiyumaru. But could a plesiosaur really be the explanation here? The photos sure look like they showed a plesiosaur, with the body, fins, neck, and head all distinctly visible. Yano's description also supported this idea, but it still seemed absurd at the same time. Thankfully, due to Yano's foresight, there was more to work with than just photos and memory of the crew, but that didn't mean things were going to be simple. Scientific analysis takes time, and sometimes it takes a lot of time. It is certainly much slower than the news cycle, and slower than excitement, which swept through Japan with the news that a plesiosaur could have been found. That plesiosaurs might be hiding in the waters off the coast of New Zealand. That perhaps, just like the coelacanth, these incredible creatures could have, against all odds, survived. Scientists in Japan were a bit more divided than the public. Some were very much convinced that the creature was a new discovery, if not going quite as far as to proclaim it a plesiosaur. Others were more conservative in their hypothesis. Across the world, in the United States and the UK, scientists were almost entirely resistant to the idea that the creature could be a plesiosaur. This could have been for many reasons, from cultural differences to experience with unknown creatures of this type, as the Zuyumaru carcass was certainly not the first large, rotting sea creature to be sighted or to wash up on shore and kick up a frenzy. This had been happening on and off throughout history, with an early example being in 1808 and occurring in Scotland. On September 25th, 1808, a strange creature washed up on the shore of Stronsa, now Stronse, in the Orkney Islands off the north coast of Scotland. This creature bore a striking resemblance to the Zuyomaru find, with a long neck, small head, and rounded broad body, tail, and distinct limbs. However, the Stronse beast was said to have had three distinct pairs of limbs, and they were described as more like paws or wings than like flippers. The Stronza beast was larger, at initial measurements of 55 feet or approximately 17 meters long, although later reviews of information would suggest it was much closer to the Zuyumaru find, with the new estimate being 36 feet or approximately 11 meters. Notably, the skin of the creature was smooth when going from head to tail, but like sandpaper when brushed the other way. To some hearing this, that might give away immediately what is now believed to be the identity of the Stronze beast, a shark. But no tests were ever done, and no part of the body was preserved, so this identification was speculative at best. However, this case and many similar others were known to the scientists taking a serious look at the Zuyumaru carcass. Spirited debate, a scientist's very favorite thing, sprung up all over the world, going back and forth, and sometimes getting a bit vitriolic. Scientists love to argue about things they believe they're right about, and argue they did. Some stuck with the plesiosaur theory, while others posited alternate explanations such as a whale, as had initially been suspected by Yano when the body was first pulled from the water, or a shark, or perhaps even a very large seal. And yet another group of scientists contended that there just wasn't enough information yet, and the samples Yano had provided would likely settle things once and for all if everyone would just wait for the analysis, but no one wanted to wait, and the media had questions. Aside from the main one of the creature's identification, or even general questions about whether there's evidence of a still-living plesiosaur population, one reporter raised an alternative idea. Could the body have been frozen in ice, or otherwise preserved for millions of years, then broken free and floated through the ocean until it was caught up in the Zuyomaru's nets? Although the idea was almost immediately thrown out, with the explanation being that it was incredibly unlikely the body could have made it that far without being entirely eaten, it was at least an idea that had attempted a balance between the want to believe and a more grounded explanation. But it wasn't just scientists, or the media, or the general public that got into the discussion and debate. There was another distinct group that was fascinated by the creature, and which still discusses and analyzes it to this day. Young Earth Creationists. Young Earth Creationism is a religious movement that maintains that the Book of Genesis is a very literal telling of the creation of the Earth, including that these events occurred somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago. 
Very few scientists of any religious or non-religious background hold these beliefs, as the evidence for the Earth being nearly 5 billion years old is very strong, and backed up in many, many different ways. However, young Earth creationism does have a few scientists who take their work very seriously. Several of them took an interest in the Zuyumaru find, arguing both for and against the idea of a modern plesiosaur being found. Several of their papers can be found online, and new ones are still being written to this day. But finally, the first answers would start to come in on July 25th, with the preliminary results of tests run on the sample that Yano had collected. This main initial test conducted was an analysis of the protein structures of the sample, specifically the amino acids. These were compared with laboratory samples to look for a likely match. The acid tyrosine was found at an amount of about 40 parts per 1,000, a close match for a sample of a blue shark, which had 44 parts tyrosine per 1,000. This indicated that the creature was likely a shark, or at the very least something in the closely related family, such as rays like manta or stingrays. But there were problems with the idea that the creature was a shark, with one issue being particularly noteworthy. Where was the dorsal fin? Fortunately, that question could at least be partially answered right away. Although it hadn't been noticed by the crew due to the condition of the body, Yano's photograph of the back of the creature showed what many pointed out looked very much like a dorsal fin. But that same photo of the back of the creature also raised another argument against the shark theory, which was the distinct vertebrae. However, sharks not only have vertebrae, just made of cartilage instead of calcified bone, but further inspection indicated that the vertebrae in the picture weren't vertebrae at all. Instead, they were myocomata, a distinct pattern of muscle tissue that forms vertically and can be recognized in many types of fish, including sharks. Other issues were also raised, both for and against the shark theory. The rib cage, which is a point of contention, believed to be both too short for a plesiosaur and too long for a shark, but the massive overall size of this creature indicated it was possible that the rib cage did belong to a shark. Proportions of the body were also outside the norm for a plesiosaur, with the body taking up too large a portion of the overall form, and the neck being both too long and too short to match up with either category of plesiosaur. However, sharks really don't have necks at all, and this was another point of contention. But remember the Stronce beast? It had also looked very similar, and was also believed to have been a shark. Part of the reason for this is that sharks have a very unusual pattern of decay, one which very quickly renders the body unrecognizable as a shark, but very reminiscent of a sea monster, if not specifically a plesiosaur. When a large shark decays, the parts of its body that are not as strongly attached through muscle or cartilage are the first to drop off. This is very common not just with sharks, but body decomposition in general. Things that are less strongly attached come apart from the main body due to the elements and scavengers. For a shark, this is often the lower jaw first, along with the gills and the general gill area. The tail commonly goes next, and often the dorsal fin as well, rendering the point about a dorsal fin more or less moot anyway. Although it does appear that there's a dorsal fin in the picture, it doesn't really matter if there is one or not for the shark theory. Without the lower jaw, gill area, tail, and possibly the dorsal fin, what's left of the shark is the central body, the pectoral and pelvic fins, what looks like a neck with a medium or small head, and the tapered end of the body that can then look like a tail. This is almost an exact match for the Zuyomaru's find, but to be sure, the measurements that Yano had taken could and should be compared with particular shark species to look for a match, which people did do. Fortunately, the massive size of the find narrows down the possible candidates dramatically. Few sharks reach 10 meters long. Great whites are typically a little over half that size at most, with about 5 meters or approximately 16 feet being the upper end of average. However, there is one species that fits very nicely into the size range of the Zuyumaru find, and it is known to decay in the exact pattern believed to have produced the plesiosaur-like body, the basking shark. Basking sharks are big. They are the second largest species after the whale shark, and average about 7.9 meters or approximately 26 feet. However, extremely large specimens are not unheard of, topping out around 11 meters or approximately 36 feet. With the Zuyomaru body being approximately 32 feet long, this fits it within the size of a basking shark, even accounting for the loss of length due to the loss of the tail and general decomposition. It would have just been a very large specimen. More evidence came in in the form of measurements taken by Yano that described the proportions of the find. These were a nearly exact match, with the neck and head section being approximately 1.9 meters, the tail 2 meters, and the body 6.05 meters. This aligns very well with a basking shark of the same overall size. So, pretty good evidence, but this is all still based on pictures, measurements, and patterns. Good evidence, but not as good as one might want. But then, finally, the detailed test results were in. This time, the amino acid results were much more extensive, comparing not just tyrosine, but an entire panel of different acids. The laboratory sample tested against had also been treated with bleach, just like the unknown samples had been, in order to get a more accurate comparison. They weren't exact, but they were very, very close. 
more than close enough to make the scientists very confident in their conclusion that Zuiomaru's unidentified creature was almost certainly a basking shark. Not only were many of the acids an exact or near exact match when it came to parts per thousand, the presence of tyrosine at such high amounts once again confirmed that this was a shark of some sort, or at the very least in a related family, as any other creature would not have had results in the 40s, but more in the realm of five. A very distinct difference. However, the small discrepancy did open the door for continued discussion. Those who clung to the plesiosaur theory argued that we don't actually know what amino acids plesiosaur tissue contains, which is true. However, if this were still somehow a plesiosaur sample, it would be necessary to believe that plesiosaurs, which were reptiles, had an amino acid makeup that, in modern day, only occurs in the shark and ray family. Additionally, continued analysis of the samples showed that the physical makeup of the fibrous tissues was consistent only with sharks and rays once again, and were a particularly close match for a basking shark. A myriad of other small inconsistencies also remained, and some are still debated to this day, but each of them have compelling counter-arguments in support of the shark theory. Although the evidence isn't completely airtight, it's overwhelmingly in favor of the identification as a basking shark, much to the disappointment of people around the world. But what can we learn from this whole thing? The Zuiumaru creature was one of the most detailed accounts of a find like this, thanks to the crew, and particularly Yano's thinking to collect so much evidence. This evidence not only provided contextual information such as the measurements and photos, but also physical samples that allowed for an almost, if not entirely conclusive, set of tests to be conducted. That means that this kind of find can now serve as a comprehensive example for others of its type, and do so based on direct facts and physical tests, rather than speculation or hypothesis, which had been the tools used for the Stronsay Beast and many others to follow it. But as cool as it is to have actual information and actual tests, it really would have been cool if it was a plesiosaur. <laughs> and that's it. That's the Zuiyumaru creature. Uh, this was one of my favorites when I was a kid. I saw a picture of this thing in some encyclopedia of the weird or whatever I had, um, and I remember reading the like three paragraph description of it over and over and over again. It did not contain the information about the basking shark in that. I got this information from a particular website, paleo.cc slash paluxy slash plesios.html, which I will link below. This is an amazing resource. It's an article that was originally published in the National Center for Science Education in 1997, and it is great. It is the most comprehensive overview of this entire thing, and it also includes all of the information on the amino acids and the comparisons and all of that, which I left out on purpose because you should go to this website. It's very, very cool. It also includes all of the smaller arguments that I didn't cover for and against why this would be a plesiosaur or a shark or blah, 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 blah. So so really, really cool. It is where I got a lot of these images to and the comparisons, so definitely go and check them out. It was very hard to find primary sources on this, so this website kind of served as the main primary source. Though again, I did find a few Young Earth Creationist articles that were actually pretty objective, so that was cool to see. Even though this is a pretty much a solved case, I always found it really, really fascinating. And the pictures are really eerie. Could you imagine pulling that out of the ocean in the 70s? That's wild. So I hope you all enjoyed this one, even though it was a bit more scientific than everything else. Um, obviously, I've been away for a little bit. I explained in my community tab kind of why that was. So it sucked, <laughs> but I am hopefully going to get back into the swing of things here soon. I don't believe I'll be able to get anything done for Halloween as a Halloween special or anything. However, I do think I'll do a stream. I don't know what it's going to be. Maybe it'll be a research stream. Maybe we'll watch scary videos. Maybe I'll play Resident Evil Village again. Who knows? Certainly not me. However, I really appreciate you getting to the end of this video, and I appreciate all of the support and the kind words that people have given me over the past few months. You all have been amazing, and I really appreciate having you here. So I hope you enjoyed, and I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.